Well, hey, it is good to see you, and uh, welcome to North Shore, those of you online and here in the room. And let me just quickly say before I dive in, I'm so looking forward to that uh, vision night that we have coming up next Sunday night. Um, such a unique chance to just come together, um, either whether it's folks that call North Shore home or you're just curious about sort of what's the future look like for us. Um, we would love to have you there. It's going to be a night of worship, a night of praying together, um, uh, just some other special surprises and experiences that you will not want to miss. Um, for those of you who are online, it will be available online, of course, as well. Um, but if you come here on campus, there will be pie, all right? And so, if for no other reason, be here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock for pie, all right? So, pie is powerful. So, anyway, it is so good to see you all, and uh, I don't think I said this yet, I'm Wolfgang, I work here, and um, thank you for joining us. Some of you that were here last week, I just want to say thank you quickly for your grace um, and for your kind words. Those of you who weren't here last week, you may not know that uh, on Saturday morning I got a text that Scott was sick, and so I had 24 hours, uh, a little less than that, to put together a message um, last week, and so many of you had such kind things, encouraging things to say. One thing I kept hearing over and over again was, you should only take a day to prepare more often, they said. <laughs> So I'm not exactly quite sure how to process that, to be perfectly honest with you. So, in that spirit, I thought I'd try a little experiment. I actually didn't start this message until this morning. Um, I just hit brew on the Keurig and started typing and say what comes out. So uh, let's see where this thing goes. But um, no, 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 that's not true at all, because the topic we're talking about today, so important, and one that I'm very glad you're here um, as we dive into today. We've been in a series, as David mentioned earlier, called When in Doubt, where we're talking about the reality that every one of us deals with doubt in one point or another. The question isn't will we deal with it, it's like how will we handle it when it comes? And the goal of this series hasn't been to answer every imaginable question or to squash out guilt or, or I'm sorry, uh, doubt and make you feel guilty about doubting. None of that helps anybody. It's to create a space where we can talk openly about how do you process doubt? How do you doubt well? That's what we're trying to figure out. And we want to help you with that. Because we do not want to be the kind of place that deals in shallow answers, that sort of sends a message that, hey, check your brain at the door, that kind of deal, that is not okay. I don't want to be part of that sort of thing. I don't think any of us do. And there is no downside to sincerely asking, genuinely exploring these questions of faith. So I'm glad you're here for it. And today is a big one, because in so many ways it's sort of foundational to much of what it is that we believe. It's, what about this book? What about doubts about the Bible? Whatever you believe or think about the Bible, there is no denying that it is unlike any other book in human history. It is by far, year after year, the best-selling book in the world. In fact, yeah, well, you're excited about that, yes. That's cool. It's so commonly the number one selling book that they've stopped including it on the bestseller lists every week because it would win every single week. They just leave it off now. Now, of course, some of you may be newer to this. The Bible is not actually one book. It's actually a collection, a little enclosed library of 66 books. Uh, one major section is the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. The other is the New Testament. And basically, the, the, the dividing point is before the life of Jesus and after the life of Jesus. And uh, uh, it was written by over 40 authors over 1,500 years uh, of time, and it is not only a unique book in its makeup, it's one of the most controversial books of all time. There are still, today, right now, dozens of countries around the world where you would be arrested for giving this book to someone else, or where you even telling about what's in this book. Some people watching right now online in those settings, in those environments right now. And yet it's endured. This book has been burned, banned, banished by some people trying to wipe it out. But despite the best efforts of some of the nastiest people in all of history, it has endured. So there's no book more popular, there's no book more controversial, and yet many would say no, more, no book more loved and no book more powerful than this. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. And I want to start with what it says about itself. And I'll get to this in a second, because I know logically that's not a real great place to start, but let me explain why. The Bible makes this sweeping claim about itself in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
The Apostle Paul writes, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. This is from the New Living Translation. I'm using this one because I think the words are a bit clearer on this particular passage. Because here's what I've found. Often people that are exploring faith, they sort of experience this, this verse backwards. Here's what I mean. They run into some situation in their life, some questions, some struggles, some stress, and they say, well, I've looked everywhere else for advice. Maybe I'll take a look at what the Bible has to say. And they begin to discover that this actually teaches us to do what is right. It points toward incredible principles for handling relationships, for dealing with stresses, for looking for hope, for handling our money. I mean, just across the board. Um, it points us to good practical things that steer us in a good direction and say, interesting. So, and then they begin to discover, well, it also points out some things that aren't so good. It begins to point out somewhat what's wrong in our life. And it does it with unabashed directness. It challenges the reality of sometimes the selfishness in my heart, the pride in our heart. It calls out social evils, like we saw on display yesterday in Buffalo and in so many other places, of course, around the world. It calls out that stuff as evil and dark and wrong. We begin to realize, wait a second, it's right on. Some of this wrong stuff in my life, I, I gotta think something about this. And they say, wait a second, if that means maybe there is some truth to this, and then they get to that moment where they have to ask, wait a second, where's this from? Is this from people or is this from God? Is there something supernatural? Is there truth I can rely on here? You know what I'm talking about this process? I've seen it happen over and over again in my ministry years. People get exposed to some truth in the Bible, they discover it actually works. People begin to be convicted by some wrong, they realize, yeah, that is something that probably needs to change in my life. And then they start to think, well, maybe this is from God when some friend says to them, hey, 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 wait a minute. I'm glad you're finding some direction, some hope, some purpose. I'm so glad you're starting to read that thing. That's awesome. But don't get carried away. You're telling me this is some supernatural message from God. How can you say the Bible is inspired by God? And don't, do, don't point to a verse that talks about itself. That kind of circular logic just doesn't hold up, right? Anybody who's read the Bible knows it's full of unreliable history. They know it's loaded with implausible claims that don't have any evidence or reason behind them, and it's totally irrelevant and outdated to our lives. Unreliable history, implausible claims, totally irrelevant and outdated. Now, there are so many things that we could say about these objections and about this whole subject, right? In fact, several years ago now, we did a whole series on questioning the Bible. It's like six or seven weeks, week after week, digging deeper and deeper into this stuff. But in a little bit of time that I have today, what I want to do is I want to kind of come toe-to-toe -to -toe with those accusations. Is the Bible full of unreliable history, just legends and myths that are made up? Is it filled with implausible claims that have no grounding in reason or evidence? And is it totally outdated and irrelevant to our lives? What's the evidence or the reason point to? Well, let's just walk through these one at a time. The first one, how reliable or unreliable is the history recorded in the Bible? I mean, the Bible's full of all kinds of details, locations, cities, names, all sorts of details that we can find out from other sources. Are they reliable or are they not? So let's try this. Let's do this. Uh, listen to this description. One of the greatest technological achievements of the last century was when NASA did what no one thought they could do. That amazing day in 2009 when Tom Hanks and Tim Allen stepped off their ship onto the surface of Mars and famously said, to infinity and beyond. All right? Now what's wrong with that statement? There's a lot wrong with that statement, right? First, it's got the wrong place. NASA did what seemed impossible by sending astronauts to the moon, right? Not to Mars. Elon Musk is going to take care of that part, right? <laughs> Second, it's got the wrong people. Tom Hanks and Tim Allen, they're the guys from Toy Story, right? It was Neil Armstrong that first set foot on the moon. And he didn't say to infinity and beyond, of course, again, Buzz Lightyear, Toy Story. He said... One stall, small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And of course, the date, completely wrong. It wasn't 2009, 
It was 1969. See, friends, reliable history gets these kinds of details right. Dates, people, places. So what about the Bible? Now, when you study the Bible and you compare it with other historical sources of its day, and you look at the archaeological record, there are volumes of documentation and corroboration and cross-checking that indicate that the Bible is solid history. All those details that, frankly, didn't even need to be included but are, they check out. In fact, even if you'd never read the Bible at all, you could learn from other ancient sources completely outside the Bible, whether it's a Jewish work like the Talmud or other ancient historian writers, uh, historical writers like Josephus, Tacitus, and others, you could know Jesus actually existed. Historical fact. Jesus was a Jewish teacher. You could know many believed that he performed healings and other sort of inexplicable, miraculous things. You could discover that some believed he was actually the Messiah that had been promised throughout the Old Testament. Other sources would confirm for you that he was rejected by the religious leaders of his day, that he was crucified under the authority of a historical figure for whom we have great evidence, Pontius Pilate, during the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. Despite his death, other sources would confirm his followers who believed that he'd risen from the dead, they spread beyond that little area of Israel or Palestine, they spread all over the known world, they were in Rome by just a few decades later, and they were made up of people of all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, people from the cities, people from the country, uh, men and women, uh, slave and free. They believed that he was divine, that they worshiped him as God. None of that do you have to look to the Bible for. It's all historical sources outside the Bible that tell us that's what people thought or were doing at the time. There's also remarkable agreement between the archeology span and the Bible. And I'll just admit, I could nerd out on this for a long time, all right? So I will try to contain myself. But let me just cite one example here quickly. Uh, it's the report of a, a gentleman, well-known scholar named Sir William Ramsey of Oxford University. He lives several generations ago, but he's regarded as one of the greatest archaeologists to ever live. I mean, Indiana Jones has nothing on this guy, okay? Ramsey concluded upon his own examination of the writings of the New Testament that they, the writers, were historians of first rate, that they should be set alongside some of the greatest historians of all time, especially the ancient world. So overwhelming was the archaeological evidence to support the truth and trustworthiness of the Bible that Ramsey himself became a committed follower of Jesus. And what's interesting is that over the years, when there have been contradictions between the Bible and what we found in the historical record, further archaeological discoveries have only bolstered the Bible's credibility. Here's another quick example. Uh, in the New Testament, there's a writer named Luke who writes the book of Luke, the gospel telling the story of Jesus' life, and a book called Acts that follows what happened in the early church. Um, and there's a phrase or term that's used by Luke several times, um, uh, this term uh, politarch, to describe a local official. And for years, there was no evidence of that term being used um, in any other context. So people said, see, they made this stuff up. This isn't actually true. Until they found an ancient uh, Roman arch from the first century with an inscription that begins in the time of the politarchs. It reinforced the claim in Acts 17.6 of using that term. And since then, archaeologists have found more than 35 inscriptions that mention that same term that previously had only been known from Luke. In fact, archaeologists have carefully examined Luke's references to 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine Mediterranean islands, and every one of them checks out historically and geographically. The truth is, the more they dig, the more they discover how accurate it is historically. And it's not just Luke. You can use, again, sources other than this book, other records and materials from the ancient world that definitively confirm the historical existence of at least 83 people from both the Old and New Testament that are mentioned in this book, other evidence of their existence. Now, some of you guys don't care at all about all this stuff, but that's pretty compelling stuff. The point is, this is not just a collection of myths and legends that have been thrown together. 
And yes, I'll admit, the Bible can be challenging. There are parts of it that are hard to understand. I'll say more about that in a bit. But you cannot simply dismiss this as a work of fiction, just a collection of, you know, fairy tales and legends. The Bible passes a history test with flying colors. So let's look at the next big objection that people often raise. It's full of implausible claims. I mean, come on. Have you actually read this thing? It claims to be architected by God, engineered or inspired by him. It claims that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he's some fulfilled, promised coming one. This one who came as a substitute for our sins to raise from the dead. It makes claims about miracles like uh, disabled people who can suddenly walk, blind people who can suddenly see, uh, deaf people who can suddenly hear. I mean, is any of that credible? Or is this all just legend that crept up over the following couple of centuries in his life? There is incredible evidence and reason to believe those things really happened. And one of those pieces of evidence has to do with fulfilled prophecy. I see the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bible is full of promises about things that would one day happen. And hundreds of years before Jesus ever walked the planet, over 200 predictions were made in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, about what Jesus' life would look like, what he'd do, where he'd be from, and so on. In fact, one of these amazing predictions uh, comes from Isaiah 53, where it details that he would be rejected, he would be a man of sorrows, he would live a life of suffering, he would carry our sorrow, he would be pierced for our transgressions, he would be wounded for our sins, he would die for, with the wicked, he would be sinless, live a perfect life, and in the midst of his suffering, he would pray for those inflicting that suffering on him. That was all written by a prophet 700 years before any of it happened. And if you know anything about Jesus' crucifixion, you know those details align perfectly with what happened that horrible day. And when you take passages like Isaiah 53 that are fulfilled in this Jesus of Nazareth, and you couple them with other passages like Micah 5.2 that says the Messiah would be born in a little town called Bethlehem, or Genesis 49 that predicts that Jesus would come from the line of a family named, named Judah. And you realize all of this was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. You have this incredible evidence for the trustworthiness of these texts. We know they were written long before Jesus lived because of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which confirmed their ancientness. One time we had a guest uh, speaker at a church where I previously served. I was living and working at a, a church in Las Vegas years ago. And some of you have heard of him. His name was Lee Strobel. And um, very good guy. I've spent some time with him. Lee was a former atheist, had a law degree from Yale. He spent 13 years as an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And he's written some books uh, for people that are wrestling with these questions that I think are worth checking out if you're in that place. Um, well-known books, one for instance, The Case for Christ, which examines some of the things we're talking about, and also The Case for Faith, that digs into some of the big questions that people often have. Anyhow, Lee talked about um, how when he was doing his investigation into the truth of Christianity, or the falsehood of Christianity, he was overwhelmed by some of this fulfilled prophecy uh, information. I remember he talked about a study that was done by some mathematics students, where they had calculated the odds, the chances, that any human being throughout history could fulfill just eight of the more than 200 promises that were made about who Jesus would be, or the Messiah would be. And they determined that the likelihood, mathematically, of anybody just happening to hit all eight of those predictions would not be one in a million, or one in a billion, or one in a trillion. It would be one chance in 100 million billion. Okay, that's a huge number. That is a one with 17 zeros after it. One in that number chance. And of course, I was working back at Vegas at the time. We knew long odds when I lived back in there, okay? We get that stuff. Anyway, Lee was talking about this and he used a description that I will never forget. He held up this little bathroom ceramic tile that he said he and his wife were using to remodel their bathroom. A little inch and a half by an inch and a half. And he said, if I took tiles like this and I, I tiled the entire auditorium and then the entire church building, and then I tiled the entire city, and then I tiled the entire state, in fact, the entire United States and Canada 
and Mexico and Africa and South America and Asia and Antarctica and even Australia. Every square inch of dry land on the planet. Tile it with one of these little inch and a half by inch and a half tiles. And on the bottom of one of those tiles, face down so you couldn't see it, put a gold star somewhere on the planet. What are the odds that anybody throughout history could fulfill just eight of these promises in the Old Testament? That would be like inviting you to walk this planet, go anywhere you want, you go to Rio, you go to Sydney, you go to Rome, you go to Beijing, you go to Yakima, although why would you go there? Um, anyway, you go wherever you want, but you can only bend down and pick up one tile. What are the odds that it would happen to be the tile with the star on the bottom? Those are the same odds that any human being throughout human history could fulfill just eight of these Old Testament prophecies. That's impressive. But Jesus did that and so much more. He didn't just fulfill eight of these prophecies, but more than 200. And Jesus himself had this to say um, in Luke 24. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's the three major categories of the Hebrew Bible. And it was but only in Jesus of Nazareth. You say, all right, Wolfgang, okay, well, I don't totally follow all the tile stuff you're saying, but I, what about all the stories about the miracles and stuff? I mean, healing people, walking on water, rising from the dead. I mean, is there actually reason to believe that actually happened? I've never seen that happen. Were there people that actually saw this that we can, like, trust that know it happened? Well, it turns out there's very good evidence, very good reason the oldest records of Jesus' life are the books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were pulled together by eyewitnesses or based on eyewitness accounts of people who actually saw this stuff happen. And the Apostle Peter, who was one of those original uh, 12, he wrote this in 2 Peter 1. He said, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw this stuff ourselves. There were over 500 eyewitnesses of Jesus after the resurrection. Sometimes we tell the story and it almost get this impression that it's just a small little group of disciples and a few of the women that were there at that time that witnessed and saw him firsthand. It's not what the New Testament says. It says there were more than 500 that saw him after that first Easter. You say, well, wait, wait, wait. maybe those people were all lying. I mean, I was just recently flipping through the channels. I came across one of those Law and Order shows, right, or like NCIS, and those have been around almost as long as the Bible, right? And I was watching an episode where an eyewitness lied. So man, how can we know eyewitnesses aren't lying? But consider this. Would they be willing to lie for what they knew was a lie? I'm sorry, would they be willing to die for what they know was a lie? Do you think... Do you think those eyewitnesses, at some point, one of them would have cracked? And they would have said, please don't cut off my head. We made all this up, if they had. It just makes sense. And then another piece of evidence, not just them as eyewitnesses, but people who also, who weren't believers, but still eyewitnesses. Let's frame this this way. If, if you and I were to go down to T-Mobile Park, right, maybe last week when the Mariners were here in town and we watched a game, and we were just randomly invited to come out and take batting practice on the field. And let's say Robbie Ray, right, who was expected, you know, not doing as great as everybody hoped, but last year's Cy Young winner, he comes out there and he's throwing us 90 mile an hour fastballs. And you watched me try to hit a few of those pitches out of the ballpark. You're an eyewitness to what happened there. And let's say after it was over, you hear me telling somebody else, you should have seen me. I stepped into that batter's box, I faced down a Robbie Ray fastball, and I turned on that ball, drove it out of the park just like Junior used to do back in the day, right? And then I did it again. And then I did it again. Three times in a row, I did this. Now, if you had seen me try to do this, wouldn't you call me on that and jump in and say, he did not? He's lying. 
He stepped into that, pl- that batter's box and he looked like a little scared boy is what he looked like. In fact, he didn't even get the bat off his shoulder before the pitch was already in the catcher's mitt. He never got close to even hitting the ball, let alone knocking it out of the park. You wouldn't stand by and let me tell a lie that you knew for yourself was fabricated. Because you saw it too. You see, the eyewitnesses uh, who wrote about Jesus were preaching to people who had lived at the same time and in the same places where Jesus had lived. And this is important, because if the disciples were exaggerating all this, or they're making up stuff that didn't actually happen, the audience would have called them on it. That's not true. And yet, it describes moments where after Jesus was killed, when Peter was speaking to a crowd in the same city where the crucifixion had taken place, many of those same people, just a month and a half before, had seen Jesus be killed. And Jesus talked that day about miraculous signs that Jesus had done how they had crucified him, and how he had raised to life. And they were eyewitnesses of these events. In other words, come on, guys. You saw yourself what Jesus did. You saw yourself. Some of you saw blind Bartimaeus be healed. Some of you ate the lunch from those two fish and five biscuits that he miraculously multiplied. Some of you went to Lazarus' funeral, and then four days later, you saw him in the grocery store. Right? You guys saw this stuff. You know this happened. And the audience's reaction is very interesting. They don't say, we don't know what you're talking about. You're making up stories, man. Instead, it says they were cut to the heart, convicted. They asked, what can I do to be saved? And in response to it, over 3,000 people became followers of Jesus, were baptized that day. They put their faith in him. Because they knew Peter was telling the truth. Friends, when you add up the prophecies, the eyewitness uh, evidence, all these different factors, I won't deny these these stories are incredible. But friends, there is sound logic and reason and evidence that points toward them being trustworthy and true. Now one last thing in the couple minutes that I've got left. I want to just address this question of, isn't the Bible just irrelevant? Isn't it outdated? Isn't it past its date, right? How can a book like that, so old, I mean, I got a phone that's three years old and it's virtually trash, right? How can a book that's been around for centuries still be relevant to my life? And again, what I found is usually that kind of statement comes from someone who hasn't actually read this for themselves. I'll just be blunt. Because honestly, we don't hear that very much around people who've been around North Shore any length of time. Because more often than not, well, people will say, I hear it in the lobby almost all the time. I know Scott does as well. You guys, it's almost like you know what's happening in my life right now. It's like you're looking over my shoulder, like you're somehow reading my texts. Friends, I'm here to tell you, it's not us. Scott might be reading over your shoulder. I don't do that kind of thing, right? (laughs) It's our truth stores. Actually, it's pretty easy to speak into real life when you're walking through a book like the Bible because it gives incredibly practical answers for raising kids, for managing anger, for relating on the job, for building friendships, for breaking bad habits, for managing money, for balancing the stressful demands of life for how to find fulfillment in a personal relationship with God. I mean, there has never been a book like this in human history. And the truth is, millions of people claim that what they've learned and encountered by studying this book, the relationship it's helped build between them and God has transformed their lives. It's completely changed their worldview. It's changed their relationships, their their values what they dream about, their hope. Now again, are there challenging things in the Bible? Absolutely. It's interesting, even the apostle Peter uh, was commenting on some of Paul's writings back in the New Testament. He himself even said, there are some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. So even in that day, hard to understand. And there are what seem to be contradictions and some moral and historical difficulties in certain places. And many of these things can be understood in part by understanding the different kinds of literature that are in here or, or the, what, what was happening, the context it was written to. 
But there are parts of this book that leave me scratching my head. I'll admit it. I've studied it for years. I have advanced degrees in it. Honestly, if I'm just totally blunt with you guys, there are parts I wish weren't in here because they're hard. They fly in the face of what I want to be or what our culture says ought to be. I mean, all that stuff about denying myself, I'd rather that wasn't in here. All that stuff about loving those who disagree with me, not my thing. Forgiving people who've wronged me, I'd rather hold on to the grudge. And yet this challenges me, it stretches me, it even makes me uncomfortable at times. It's hard. And I acknowledge that. In fact, if you wrestle with doubts and you're struggling with some of what's in here, let me just tell you, it's okay to struggle with this and to wrestle and to ask questions, but do not dismiss it as being legend or silliness. It is worth taking seriously. Now friends, there's so much more that can be said. And like I said last week, if you wanna dig deeper into some of these questions, there are amazing resources out there. We'd love to help. Um, Earlier, David talked about that connection card that was on your seat or in the seat back in front. And here it is, uh, of course, for those of you online that you can scan that as well. If you mark, I'm exploring questions about God, this week I'll send you a follow-up email that has some things you may want to explore. But I also want to send, like, how to start reading it, some suggestions about how to start to dig in, um, some favorite Bible apps that I personally use in my own growth and study and learning. And if you're here on our Kirkland campus and you'd like an actual physical copy of the Bible, like go old school, uh, we have a lot, and I'd love to give you one. After the service, I'll be hanging out over here in the corner. Uh, just come over there. I'd love to give you one. I'll mark a good place to start. Because again, it's not like every other book where you start at page one and work your way through. There are good places to begin, especially if you're new to all this, and I'd love to help you learn about that. So we can help with that. See, that's... The biggest question in all of this, as I finish, when it comes to this conversation, what are you going to do with this book? Because you can't just dismiss it as unreliable history or full of implausible claims or irrelevant or outdated, because that doesn't stack up against the reality. And I know stories of this book are incredible, and it takes faith to embrace it, but it's not blind faith. It's faith based on reason and evidence. So what are you gonna do with that evidence? Because I'll tell you, I've been a pastor now for more than 25 years, and I'll tell you one thing I have never heard anybody ever say in that time. I've never heard anybody say a single time, I made the decision to build my life on the wisdom of the Bible, to build my relationship with Jesus based on the teachings of this Bible. I decided to build how I handle my relationships, my family, my career, my money, all of it. I decided to build that all on the teachings of the Bible, and now I realize that was a terrible decision. No one has ever said that in my entire life. On the contrary, what I've heard is people say one of the greatest decisions I ever made was to embrace a relationship with God and learn about him in this book. I have regrets about times I ignored what this had to say, but I have nothing but gratitude for the times that I've done it. Because the purpose of the Bible isn't just to study the history or to look into trivia, and it's just not about making you live your best life now. That's not what the Bible's about. The purpose of the Bible is to bring you into a relationship with God. It's to introduce and invite us into knowing Jesus, because he is the key to unlocking all of this. And you may have questions about a story or a passage or a teaching. Don't let that distract you from the main point, because the main point, this book is all about Jesus. It's about a God who knows you, who loves you so much, he was willing to come down the stairs, if you were here last week, into our lives with our struggle and our stresses and our sin and walk with us and bring us into relationship with him. He wants you as part of his family. And this book is full of stories of people who were messed up, desperately screwed up, and God stepped in and he walked with them through those struggles. And friends, I believe God still wants to tell those kinds of stories today in your life. 
whatever struggle you're facing, whatever issue you're dealing with, he wants to come into your story and write a new story for you. The same God who did it again and again and again. It's the story he wants to write in your life. And that all begins when we actually explore what this book has to say, even in the face of our doubts. Begin to take what it says into our life, to live it out, to begin to build that relationship with him. See what story God wants to write. And with that in our hearts, let's bow our heads together. Let's pray. Would you bow your head with me as we finish up? Oh God, I'm grateful for this book. I'm grateful for what you've taught me in this book. I'm grateful for the way you've corrected, challenged me with this book. I'm grateful for the gift it is, not just as the book, but what the book contains this good news of an opportunity to have a relationship with you. To not walk through this world aimless and without a compass, but to have a guide and a God that wants to walk with us. And I'm so grateful for that, God. Especially in light of all of the ugliness in our world, Father. We need wisdom beyond ourselves to know how to handle this stuff. How to call out the ugliness around us. How to be filled with the kind of peace and comfort that we need in our lives. Show us, I pray, God. Do in our lives what you've done in so many before that we get to learn about and read about in this book. God, use this, I pray. I thank you for how it points us to Jesus and the new life we can have because of him. And I pray these things in his name. Amen.